what what um, what we wanted to do <clears throat> um, was um, have a very special tech talk that combines a perspective from a graduate student, a very uh, superstar graduate student, Sabrina, uh, in in power electronics, um, with myself, who uh, uh, you know has been working uh, a long time, over forty seven years, uh, fifty years at IEEE, and this is my fiftieth year in HKN. I was inducted in nineteen seventy one. <clears throat> at Purdue University. Er, hey, Sabrina. All right. Hello. <laughs> All right. We're good to go. I will uh, drop out then. So much better to be able to see you. <laughs> Have a great session, y'all. Thanks. Thanks, Bob. So I was just going to, I was just saying that th this is a very special tech talk because in the real world, things aren't you know, siloed with power electronics and power engineering and computer like the IEEE societies. It's very inter interdisciplinary. So um, we're going to show, Sabrina and I are going to show uh, how in the real world things are inter interdisciplinary and how we could really do a better job of, um, of bringing different disciplines together and solve real world problems. So just briefly, again, I'll introduce myself, Sabrina, introduce herself, and then, um, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll introduce again what, what we're going to talk about briefly. Um, so I, my name is John McDonald. I'm with GE, um, G Grid Solutions. I live in Atlanta, Georgia, and um, my full-time engineering career has been 40, 47 years and still going. Um, no plans to retire. 50 years in IEEE with a lot of leadership positions, including president of the IEEE Power, Power and Energy Society in 2006 to 7, and um, 50 years with HKN, inducted uh, in May of 71 at Purdue University as a second year electrical engineering student. Um, earlier this year, when we um, I was subcommittee chair of the IEEE PS Long Range Planning Committee, and we piloted a mentoring program for PES, and we chose very special PES scholarship recipients, the, the tops in each region in the IEEE, and asked them if they wanted to be mentored as part of this pilot program. And that's when I was very fortunate to be connected with Sabrina. And um, so uh, I've mentored Sabrina. We've, we've uh, had many, many meetings since January. Um, and uh, it's been it's been a pleasure. And even though the pilot program is finished, we didn't want to stop. We're we're still uh, still having mentoring sessions. Sabrina, why don't you inter introduce yourself? Sure. Thank you so much. Uh, so I'm Sabrina Helbig. I'm a second semester master's student at the University of Pittsburgh in bright and sunny Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Which actually it's very cloudy and rainy here right now. Um, I'm in the realm of power electronics. I've done co-ops and internships with Eaton and Westinghouse Nuclear as an undergrad and a grad student. I am involved in the IEEE Power and Energy Society and Power Electronics Society, particularly in our student branch chapter at Pitt. And I'm currently the treasurer for the Beta Delta chapter at Pitt. So I'm very happy to be here today. Um, as John mentioned, he's been my mentor since this past January, and I've been very fortunate to hear his stories and wisdom and to learn so much from him so far, and I'm sure I will learn much more. <laughs> and what was fun was uh, it was a couple months ago, I think, Sabrina, that I was invited to give a distinguished lecture for PES, but it was for the IEEE Pels chapter in Pittsburgh. <laughs> I remember <laughs> <own>. that. <laughs> And Sabrina participated, and this was one of the topics. This the subject of our tech talk was part of my my talk. Um, so we have, uh, you know, with the integration of renewables into the grid, um, we have what we what we're in with the intermittency of 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 the distributed generation. It's introducing unbelievable volatility in the voltage and reactive power on the grid. 
And traditionally, our controllers on the grid have been mechanical. Well, that's okay with more of a steady state situation, but when you introduce a high penetration of renewables, um, you know, a high penetration and you factor in the intermittency, we're seeing volatility that we've never seen before that's causing our mechanical controllers to go from operating maybe five or 10 times per day to well over a hundred times per day. We're expected lifetimes are going from 35 years to less than two years, which, which is you know, not feasible. So I, I've been preaching and, and uh, you'll see this in a minute here, preaching for many, many years that we need, we have power electronic applications on the electric grid. And, and the subject of our tech talk is that, but what Sabrina and I want to emphasize is typically power electronic grad students, researchers are somewhat siloed from power systems, grad student and researchers. And we need more working together, more coordination, because we have power electronic applications on the electric grid and we can't have a siloed, we won't solve these if, if these if these uh, two areas of expertise continue to be siloed. So I'll, I'll talk more about that, but I wanted to, you know, Sabrina, you have um, perspectives from two different, what we want to hear is two different um, areas. You know, one, of course, we're all interested in is, as a grad student, as a student and grad student in power electronics, but also with the internships, the work experience you've had too, because you've, you just finished an internship this past summer. Um, and uh, so what in this this topic of our tech talk, what what are your perspectives from both your studies, you know, and your work experience? Sure. Yeah. And um, throughout my studies, I'm in a couple courses right now. One is microgrids and distributed energy resources and the other is renewables and alternative energy. And even in those two courses alone this semester, there's a lot of emphasis and context for how we have these different kinds of systems we have these different parts we want to integrate but what are these things how does it affect the system but also how do we make these things happen and so in my microgrids course we have this microgrid which is a small power system and from a power systems perspective it's got generation loads interconnections with other power systems in the grid so we have this power systems perspective, but then on the other side, we are looking at, well, how do we control this thing? How do we convert the, the power from these different modes of generation? How do we isolate from the main grid if we want to? And so we have to dive into power electronics interfaces to make those kinds of things work. And then in renewables too, we want to integrate more renewables into the grid and into our homes. But as John mentioned, some of these sources like wind and solar can be intermittent and variable. And so we need well-designed power electronics to be able to integrate that renewable energy. And also we can use them to help manage power factor and manage the volatility from these sources. I also found last semester in my, one of my power systems courses my group and I did a paper on grid forming inverters, which is a fairly new thing to come up. Um, so most inverters currently follow what the power grid or what a microgrid is doing, and they tend to need power in order to function in the first place. So if your power is out, you might not be able to have your cute little solar panel on your lamp post to actually make your lamp light up. So there's new research into inverters that can still work without power from the grid or that can help to boot up the grid in the event of a power outage in the way that generators have traditionally done. But for these systems to work, we need the perspective of what does the power system need to boot up? What are the parameters? What are the specifications? And then we need the power electronics for those inverters to actually make that work and to make this part of the system come to life. And then in the perspective of my internship, I was out in Menominee Falls, Wisconsin this summer with Eaton, and I was in their power electronics R&D group. So pretty power electronics heavy, but man, I saw that there were so many different considerations that are required when you're working on any kind of power engineering project. 
because there could be system studies. And this summer we had electronic studies, magnetics. I have tried for so long to avoid magnetics as much as possible <laughs> until I realized this summer that they're actually really, really important. Um, but on top of that, there's controls and embedded systems, mechanical layouts and heat sinking and physical layouts and assembly. So we've got power systems, power electronics, and we have a lot of other factors that come in to make these systems work and work well. Yeah, I'd, I'd say the, the hardest course I took, Sabrina, in graduate school, it was a core course, was electromagnetics. <laughs> everything else I everything else I, I had I had a feel for, but that was continued to be abstract for a long time. I could, I could never get a feel for what, what was going on. Yeah. Um so you know so I I guess what I could talk about is is a real world problem that uh was actually brought to us at GE. And um, very interesting. And it was San Diego Gas Electric. <clears throat> and um, they said, we need help. We've never experienced this before on the distribution part of our grid. And we don't know what to do. And we need you to help us. And um, they sent us waveforms on their distribution, on one distribution feeder that was unlike we had ever seen before. Okay. And so think of a distribution feeder um, it's in, in San Diego, California, where um, the homes fed from that feeder are along the Pacific Ocean. So these are beautiful homes along the ocean. And um, the tech changer in, in the substation is a mechanical controller that whose goal is to keep the secondary voltage constant no matter how, how much the primary voltage fluctuates. And the reason is the primary voltage on the grid is going to change, but you want the voltage at your home to be constant. Otherwise, your light bulbs would be really bright and really dim and really bright and really dim, and, and it would drive you crazy, right? So this tap changer is mechanical, which, which has been that way for decades. 16 raised positions, 16 lower positions, and a neutral position, all mechanical. Each position is five eighths of a percent of volts. Okay. And so what happens is if the primary voltage fluctuates, this thing automatically keeps that secondary voltage constant and it, you know, it, it automatically adjusts its taps, right? Well, on this feeder in San Diego, it was operating five, six, seven times per day. And all of a sudden the policy changed in California and the same in Arizona, similarly, where if you're a homeowner and you bought electricity, you paid 10 cents a kilowatt hour. But if you, if you installed photovoltaic panels on your roof and you sold excess electricity, you re, the, the utility was forced to pay you by policy 40 cents a kilowatt hour. That spread 40 to 10 is, is huge, which makes the business case for a, a, a homeowner very attractive. What that does is it makes your payback period, the investment you make in installing photovoltaic panels makes your payback period much, much shorter. And so um, all of a sudden, many, many homeowners installed rooftop solar panels. So much so that all of the homes on this one feeder over 35% of the homes on the same feeder all had rooftop solar panels, which, which we've never experienced before. And, and this happened very pretty quickly. So what happens was um, because these homes are along the Pacific Ocean, there's a marine layer of fog, you know, the moisture from the ocean, there's a marine layer of fog over the homes in the morning. And as that fog burned off, all of a sudden, all these homes began generating at the same time. Well, this is the voltage waveforms that San Diego Gas and Electric sent us. The voltage, literally like a rocket, when, when, when uh, these homes began generating, it spiked, you know, and then oscillated as the sun went in and out of the what was left of the fog and the clouds. And it oscillated over a wide range. This poor tap changer is trying to keep the secondary voltage constant, and it's going crazy. 
it's it's just it's just operating you know um it's never seen we've never seen volatility like that before and um it began it was operating like 120 150 times per day and its expected lifetime because it was mechanic it's mechanical was less than two years you know it was it was crazy uh to have to replace something of that cost that frequently is just not feasible so this was a sign and this so i, I wrote an article in power electronics magazine and let me just uh, i want to i'd like to keep sabrina and i here but well let me just quickly show you a slide and i'll just show you um this was part of the talk i gave that sabrina um saw this this slide here okay so on the top half of the slide what i want to emphasize is an article in power electronics magazine august 22nd 2013 um and you can you can find this you can find the link to this article by searching on the internet power electronics magazine and john mcdonald but what i want what sabrina and i want to talk about is these are three app new applications of power electronics where power electronics researchers need to work more closely with power system researchers the substation transformer online tap changer what i just talked about and then sabrina talked about voltage and reactive power volatility so we have a second application with low voltage network dynamic grid edge controllers these are actually low voltage power electronics we install on the low voltage network at the edge of the grid it could be right outside your home and they're dynamic because they're continuous set point controllers with voltage and reactive power we don't want this volatility and voltage to go proliferate up into the grid we want to mitigate that uh at where where it where it's uh injected into the grid on the low voltage network and third is increased capability from inverters and this is in, in two ways one would be the functionality from the inverters the functionality in the power electronics and second would be additional external control capability um, because we can use I'll go back to here. We can use um, we can use an inverter as a VAR source to help us with voltage on the grid. Uh, an inverter is a tremendous VAR resource for the for the grid. Okay, so these are these are three. This is just three of many applications of low voltage power electronics. So you know, as we look to the the, the near future, uh, the grid is going to be more volatile as the penetration of distributed generation increases. Uh, every, like everything, like when I, uh, you know, when I finished at Purdue, my first job was in downtown San Francisco with Bechtel Corporation, and which was a real adventure for me since I had grown up in the Midwest and never been further west than the state of Illinois. And I really found it was true that everything seems to start in California and work its way east. So. This volatility, eight years ago, I wrote this article and I find that in Arizona, um, things are, have started out there and now they're working their way. So this was a good experience eight years ago for us writing the article and working with folks at, at, at those utilities and experiences that are creeping east and we're going to see those more often. So, um, you know, I think both in, gra in graduate school as well as companies uh in the real world with with solutions and you know we we've developed a uh, a prototype power electronic tap changer and i i can see that happening more and more and as more um homeowners put pv panels on a roof i can see the need the utilities will have a need for this because it's just not feasible to use mechanical controllers anymore so what do you comments, Sabrina, from your point of view? Yeah, I was thinking about how um, power systems and power electronics can very much influence each other, um, how power systems can influence the design and operation of power electronics and power electronics can influence what we can do with the power grid. Um, 
I had one comment and then it completely slipped my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Must have been an electromagnetic wave that just, just <laughs> clouded, clouded your brain. Yeah, I think I saw the rain outside and I was like, ah, it's raining. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if I think well, of know, it, I'll let you oh, know. <laughs> one, one thing that can be confusing to folks is that there's two types of power electronics, you know, when we talk about the grid, right? And you can see that I've said low voltage power electronics because there's a whole field of technology and products with respect to high voltage power electronics, you know, and especially at University of Pittsburgh, where you are with uh, Greg Reed, Professor Greg Reed, where you get into uh, fax devices, flexible AC transmission systems, uh, STATCOM, uh, uh, you know, you know, U UPC, there, UFC, there's, there's many, many technologies we use with high voltage DC. And, and there you get into high voltage power electronics. That's, that's something we use those a lot. It's, it's called grid enabling technologies to help us um, control the flow of electricity and, and, and uh, alleviate congestion on, but the, here we're on the transmit more on the transmission network. What we're talking about here in our tech talk is low voltage power electronics um, and grid edge controllers. So we're at the edge of the low voltage network, um, you know, um, so that's, um, did you think of it, Sabrina? <laughs> I think I did. <laughs> All right. Um, my one comment was about how um, with power electronics, we can, you know, design different controllers to be able to more dynamically work with these systems rather than um, like in the traditional grid, things were very centralized and it was generation right. transmission distribution. Um, and now we're connecting all of these different kinds of devices and seeing these different phenomena on the distribution system itself. And so with the power electronics, we can do a little bit more um, switching and a little more regulation dynamically. You know, that's an excellent point because for years, actually for decades, all the investment was at the generation transmission part of the grid, very little in, in distribution. And um, it, people would never have thought in, in, the, in the near past that we would invest and we would distribute intelligence down to the distribution part of the grid. You know, you're exactly right. Everything was was focused on transmission and generation because that's that's the more critical part of the grid. And but what we're finding now with more focus on distribution, that's where you save a lot of money. If the power factor is not good, uh, you're throwing away a lot of money. Also, reactive power takes up space on on the um, electrical system and that space that could be used to host distributed generation. See, you might hear the term hosting capacity. Uh, we're actually using low voltage power electronics with volt bar control, voltage and reactive power control to free up hosting capacity so we can uh, integrate more, um, you know, more distributed generation on the grid. So that excellent point. We're, we're distributing intelligence not only centralized from the control center to the substation, but also from the substation down to the edge of the grid, which uh, we had never done before. That's true. So, Sabrina, you worked with microgrids, I think, a little bit, or you had some experience with microgrids. Um, Ron, Ron Jensen asked the question, the from your point of view, and I'll, I'll answer from my perspective, but what's the status of microgrids in our future? So from your experience, what, what did you work on with microgrids? Um, so the extent of my experience with microgrids so far has been this course that I'm taking in microgrids and also on a very, on a much smaller scale, my senior design team last fall made an auto grid where uh, it was a microgrid scaled much farther down for just a home office for home office loads. Okay. And so, and through those experiences so far, I'm seeing that there 
is a lot more movement towards incorporating and building microgrids because you have the resilience factor. If something happens on the main power grid, if you're operating microgrid, you can go into island mode and everything will be fine. Um, there's also the case for reliability where if you're a critical load and maybe you're concerned that the main grid won't meet all of your reliability needs, you can have your microgrid set up with your distributed generation so that you can fill in the gaps where your concerns about the power grid are. Right, right. Exactly, exactly. What's interesting though, um, when, when the concept of microgrids was first introduced, okay, for a long time, it was what I call a niche, niche technology, okay? Not one that you would see broadly attractive in many, many applications, but it had three specific applications only for quite a while. Um, very, very specific. One was university campuses, because university campuses are the electric grid on a university campus is a patchwork quilt that's been built over many years and it's very inefficient, you know? And um, so universities said, it makes sense for us to, to look at our entire campus, you know, the, the electrical grid on the entire campus and think of it as microgrid or multiple microgrids and do a better job of um, more efficiency with electricity. So that, that made a lot of sense and that happened right away. Second was military bases. You know, there, were, there was a um, emphasis with, with the uh, military to use as much renewable generation as possible. <clears throat> and it made sense, you know, that a military base could be a microgrid or its own microgrid. And if it was islanded, like you said, Sabrina, and if it had enough of its own generation, it could be uh, self-sufficient, right? It could, it could continue to operate without with being disconnected from the main grid. So that was big push with uh, military bases. And third was rural villages. And our, at GE, our very first microgrid project was in British Columbia, uh, a rural village called Bella Kula, who it, it had uh, hydrogen fuel cells, uh, PV panels, low head hydro generation, but typically with a rural village, its base generation is diesel. But it's extremely expensive to transport diesel fuel to uh, a rural village that's not near anything, okay? And, um, and then of course, when the diesel generators operate, they emit carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. And so, you, you know, you pollute the atmosphere. So. So this, this rural village, Bellacula, had residential load and industrial load that had to be satisfied all the time. But the question was, how could we minimize the use of the diesel, maximize the use of the hydrogen fuel cell, PV panels, and low head hydro generation? And so we took a microprocessor-based relay, protective relay, and uh, added logic to it to become a microgrid controller, okay? And then we added high-speed communications equipment at every, you know, at um, where the hydrogen fuel cells were, the PV panels, everywhere around that, that integrated system and kept track of what was happening so we could optimize it. And, uh, and it's been working very, very well, you know. So that, that, was, that was the three niches, okay? But now, as you said, Sabrina, the uh, resiliency is a big factor with utilities. How can we make our grid more resilient? If we're one homogeneous grid and we have a problem and we don't isolate that problem fast enough and it cascades, the whole grid could go down, okay? If we can divide up our grid into strategic microgrids that can be islanded and then continue to operate, right? We have more flexibility and more resiliency so uh, like utilities like Commonwealth Edison in Chicago are, are doing just that now. They're putting in five different strategic microgrids, not military bases, not rural villages in Chicago, right? Not university campuses, even though IIT, Illinois Institute of Technology, is very advanced with its own microgrid uh, on campus. But IIT is working closely with ComEd 
and some Department of Energy money for for this work. And um, and it's 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 for resiliency. So to answer Ron's question, the status is microgrids are really popular now and broadly attractive, not niche anymore, but broadly attractive and uh, very much in demand. Um, so there's a lot of research going on. What, what we were doing previously was coordinating and optimizing the operation of one microgrid by itself. The work that ComEd is doing now and others is, which we hadn't done before, was how do you optimize and coordinate multiple microgrids at the same time? So instead of doing one microgrid, look at regional, regional coordination of, of multiple microgrids. So it's, it's hierarchical control, right? You can optimize individually, but then you can optimize the group based on more regional criteria. Okay. And that's, that's some new areas of research that are going on. It's really fascinating. Uh, I, I see it growing, continuing to grow and uh, power electronics, you know, is a big part of that. It's what we're talking about, Sabrina, it's the integration of power electronics with power systems, um, you know, integral building blocks with, uh, with microgrids. So, so you're, are you, is a course you're taking now, right? In microgrids? Yeah. 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 It's the primary focus is microgrids. What kind of, uh, distributed generation can we incorporate into a microgrid? Um, we're gonna be looking at the power electronics interfaces of a microgrid, <clears throat> excuse me, um, controls aspects, things like that. So okay. it's, it is all about the microgrid. <laughs> Which is a great, a great course to take because of what I said, you know, it, it's, uh, it's, it's growing like mad. So uh, to be at the forefront of something that is is really um, broad. And the other thing that's exciting is it, the attractiveness is broad based. It's not niche anymore. So it's something you really want to know and, and be at the forefront of. Um, you know, the, the low voltage power electronics that we use on the grid today for Volvar control uh, was, you know, one company that's at the forefront of this is Verentech. Some of you may have heard of V-A-R-E-N-T-E-C, Verentech. Um, started and founded by, many of you may know, uh, Professor Deepak Devan, who was president of IEEE Power Electronics Society, just after I was president of PES. And um, we, you know, Verentech helped, the utilities in Hawaii had a target where uh, within a few years, 40% of their generation has to be renewable. Okay, so many, many of the public service commissions and states in the U.S. have set targets like that. Well, that's that's a huge. I mean, that that's tough tough to meet. And 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 these are islanded utilities, so they're not um, integrate. They're not tied to other utilities. You know, they're they're separate islands, which makes it more challenging. Problem was that uh, their power factors were very poor. OK, and with Verentech's low voltage power electronics doing voltage and bar reducing losses on the distribution system, they freed up a tremendous amount of capacity on the distribution system to be able to integrate uh, much, much more distributed generation than what they could before. OK, so that um, really has helped the utilities there on the islands in Hawaii help them try to meet that 40% target. Okay. Well, there's one, one other question I see about uh, ERCOT in Texas, the winter storm earlier this year, um, investing in more transmission ties to Texas. The thing, the thing is, and this is a little bit off of our tech talk topic, but um, you know, there, there's three, primary grids in the United States. There's the Eastern interconnection, the Western interconnection and Texas by itself. <laughs> and Texas wants to be by itself. Um, so that so that Texas is not under the jurisdiction of FERC, so that they're not under the national jurisdiction of FERC, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. 
they purposely have HV have DC or what we call uh, asynchronous links across their state lines with transmission ties, and very few of them, because if they had uh, AC or synchronous ties, they would be under the under the jurisdiction of FERC. So they they purposely um, want to be separate from the rest of the U.S. <laughs> so uh, on paper, you say you know, investing in more transmission ties to Texas. Well, uh, technically that may be possible, but but politically uh, that's not, not desired, okay? They, they want to continue to be independent from the rest of the U.S. So that's, that's uh, and I don't see that changing. The, the one thing, I'll, I'll just say, we had a panel session uh, with a, another group that I'm involved with, Seagray, earlier this year on, on Texas. It was recorded, so if, if if any of you want a ninety minute panel session on on that topic, I can I can send you the link. But um, uh, there are other factors involved with that um, than uh, the transmission ties. Here's one, uh, Sabrina. Um, the rise of electric vehicles. Have you with with your microgrid course? Have you talked about? Or do you think you may talk about, um, you know, the impact of, of EVs on, on the grid and particularly with a microgrid? I'm not sure if we will specifically, but one of my friends is, her research is focused on electric vehicle integration into the okay. rest of the grid. And uh, from what I've heard from others and from her, um, there's a, um, what is it? words <laughs> there's that electric vehicles could function as a load and also as right. an energy storage source so right. there's a lot of research going into what does that mean what kind of controls would we need to and what kind of equipment would we need to be able to capitalize on evs as an energy source but also to be able to provide for it as a load in the system. So you brought up you brought up a couple of things, right? One is the uh, the uh, you know the impact of the EVs on the grid from a charging point of view. You know, um, traditionally we would have a, a peak in the morning and, a, and on the load duration curve, and a peak in the evening. And the peak in the evening was traditionally higher as people got home from work pre-COVID, um, and then. The last thing you want is people coming home with EVs and plugging them in right away, right? And it would just aggravate that evening peak. So we said we need intelligence in the infrastructure to delay that charging. Now, many utilities have special time of use rates for EV owners where the price of electricity overnight is much less than it is during the day, right? To encourage people wait till like 11, 10 or 11 at night and then, and then charge your car. Um, but the other aspect of this is what you mentioned, we call V2G, right? Vehicle to grid. And it's taking the energy that might be in the batteries and um, instead of the utility using expensive peaking generation, maybe on a hot summer day, they go and access the energy in a number of EVs, right? And use that to defer their peak. Um, now, I think Many of you have heard that the new Ford F-150 truck, if you look at the batteries in that truck, there's enough energy. It's like a little power plant, <laughs> the truck. I mean, there's enough energy, energy in that truck to power your home for, for, for days, you know? So if you had a number of these uh, Ford F-150s with all the batteries, you have, you'd have quite a bit of a, a, a energy source. Question on that is though, what if you park your car, Sabrina, and you have a doctor's appointment and um, all the energy is being taken out of your batteries for a, a peak on the grid and, and you have an uh, unexpected need to use your car, you know, to go somewhere, right? Or the uh, increased charge discharge cycles of your battery from the utility lessens the life of your battery and who's going to compensate you for that, okay? So there's a lot of policy, V2G, 
the thing in the real world is technically things may be possible, but when you get in, you know, when you get into the political issues, societal issues and things like that, and, and uh, equity issues, let's say you're all your neighbors have EVs and you don't, and they're charging them. And now the distribution transformer that all your homes are fed from has to be changed and uh, increased in size because of all the EVs your neighbors have. Well, you don't have an EV yourself. Should you, when the, when the utility increases your rates to account for that, should you have to pay for that or should just your neighbors have to pay for that, right? So with, with policy, there's thing, how can we be equitable where those that are reaping the benefits are the ones paying and those that are not receiving the benefits don't have to pay. Okay, that, that's very complex, okay? And so you can see that uh, there, there's things that we have to sort out here with EVs. Um, now, I think I told you, uh, Sabrina, that you know my wife and I, we have a new Tesla Model 3 that we got four weeks ago. And so I'm now a proud EV owner myself and charging it and, and and, uh, and I feel like I'm, I'm uh, making uh, the Jetsons, the, the TV show, the Jetsons I used to watch as a kid of what the future would be. I'm now driving what, the fut what I thought the future would be. I'm now driving it. Um, but this, this when, you, when you have an EV yourself and, you be, and you're driving one and charging it, what, what we just talked about becomes very real because you're, you're experiencing it yourself. So, um, let's see. Um, so we have about five minutes left. Um, well, I guess the thing we could, what, what would we, based on what we talked about, Sabrina, what, um, oh, yeah, Nancy brought up a good point. Um, about um, since January, when we met each other and um, started men the mentoring, I guess from just from the, uh, for the last five minutes, this might would be helpful because I talked about mentoring earlier today with my talk on key insights to career management. I think people might be interested to to, to hear uh, what what were your expectations, you know, when we started and um, what, what, you know, what's been, what are the, some unexpected benefits and things that uh, have come out of all the, the sessions we've had together? Honestly, I don't know what I was expecting in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't know if anyone had ever explicitly defined, this is what a mentoring relationship could look like. These are the elements it could involve. Um, so I guess to me in the beginning, I was kind of like, okay, a person I could talk to and ask questions of just generally like that, but, uh, very quickly, like over time, but also starting very quickly, I realized this is a person with a lot of knowledge, experience, and wisdom. And I can just, I can talk to John about five K's because we both run five K's, but I can also ask questions about professional development. How has he built his career? Um, he shared with me his uh, 12 key insights to uh, his, I was going to say career management, but I don't think that's the title. You just said that, though. It is, yeah. yeah. Okay, but it is. 12, okay. 12 key things in, in, man, in your career, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, so he had shared that with me as well. Um, so what I realized I was getting out of this was, a lot i was getting to learn from someone who has been through a lot of this before so it wasn't like if i had a question about my resume or something or i've talked with john about public speaking too just anything that comes to mind i can talk to john about and ask him questions about so we set up meetings and I create an agenda with all of my questions and there's usually like 20 or something and I send them over and we go through them, talk about them, chat how things are going. Um, so it's been very beneficial, I would say, because I got to meet a new person. 
I got to, and so in, I guess, formal terms, networking. Um, John's also been a great advocate for me too. Like this uh, tech talk today, I probably wouldn't have done something like this, you know, this soon or right now at where I am in my career in grad school. But John said, hey, you know what? You're you're working with power electronics. I'm working with power systems. Let's do this. And I said, great. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> great. Great. And you also just received a scholarship. Yeah, uh, I had the uh, fortunate opportunity to get the uh, IEEE Charles Legate Fortescue Scholarship. So I'm right. very happy about that. And thank you again, John, for your support. Yeah, yeah, that was very, very cool. And, um, you know, um, the other thing is you, you've had a lot of leadership positions like HKN chapter, but, um, and I, you know, in 50 years of leadership positions, um, there's things that you learn and that's why you and I spent an hour and went through, uh, that talk I give how to build and lead a voluntary organization and really gave you a lot of good examples on how to be a more effective leader, right? It's, it's easy if you're getting paid by your company to, to have somebody do something because they feel an obligation because they work for the company. But when you're a volunteer with HKN or IEEE and you're a leader, it's more difficult, right? To, how do you get people to do things when they're busy doing other things? Um, and I've learned that over, over many, many years of different leadership positions. And that, that's fun to go through. And I, we did that one-on-one. -on -one. And um, uh, it's a lot, a lot of good examples and a lot of good ideas on how you can be a more effective leader. So, yeah. So I, I, I know we're right at time, but I, I say, I really, you know, mentoring to me is, is like I said earlier today, it's so important. And every, every student, every young professional should really look for at least one mentor um, and, um, and really spend you know, ha frequent time with that mentor and really learn that's again, that's how the science is what you learn in school, but it's the art of what we do in the real world that you can't read in a book. You have to spend time with experienced people and, um, and learn it over, over a period of time. So, yeah. Thanks Nancy for the reminder. We, that was good, good to talk about yeah, the mentoring. Any, any final comments, Sabrina? Anything to, to finish up? <laughs> <laughs> I guess uh, in a nutshell, I would say that um, as you had mentioned earlier, in school and in careers and things like that, people can get siloed into power systems or power electronics, but it's not just that <laughs> like if you're say designing a medical device for something you're not just designing a medical device because you need context for that you need to know what you're designing for who are you working with if you have if you're working on the electronics for it who's going to do the mechanical stuff who's going to design the enclosure so power systems and power electronics are not mutually exclusive domains right and that's what, that's what we tried to get across. That's why I thought this would be a good topic for a tech talk and, uh, and really uh, to have perspectives from someone like myself and then someone like you, Sabrina, with graduate student and um, with internship experience really gives two very, very different perspectives at two stages of career and, and two stages of life, which really uh, is beneficial. So thank you. Thanks, Sabrina. That was it was fun. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. <laughs> and um, so I think we're we're finished. And uh, appreciate HKN giving Sabrina and I the opportunity to do this today. Nope. Okay? Thanks so Thank much, you. John and Sabrina. We really appreciate it. We knew you'd be great, and you were. So um, I guess what look what you get to do at HKN, right? <laughs> <laughs> great. You're very great. encouraging. Well, great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I think there's a region meeting, but uh, more things to come. A Wednesday career fair, recruitment things, and next weekend, even more stuff. So um, thanks for joining us at the SLC. Take care, everyone. Thank you.